uh, normally I read translated fiction or I give you ideas to read some uh, translated fiction, but not, not today. I'm sorry for the noise outside, there are kids, a bunch of kids passing by. Yeah, I live right across uh, elementary school and in the back there's a huge playground, so they go outside and, and play during lunchtime. So yeah, um, I've read a lot of books lately. Um, I think they're all American or English, except for two. Yeah, two, uh, one is Spanish and the other is Polish. So yeah, we start. So the first book I read was Olive Kitteridge by Elizabeth Stroud and unfortunately I had seen the film before quite some time ago and uh, yeah Francis McDermott really ruined the experience for me the reading experience so I had to abandon ship it was yeah I saw her all the time whilst the, the uh, Elizabeth Stroud had a, a totally different type of woman in her mind, like a huge, formidable, large woman. And that's not Frances McDermott. She's a great actress. Uh, there's no discussion, discussion about that, but she isn't Olive Kettridge to me. And I really couldn't get her out of my mind and uh, I had to abandon ship, I'm sorry. I have to maybe wait another couple of years to read her again because I own the book. But uh, no, no, no. One of my biggest discoveries is Little by Edward Carey. I really love that book. It's a fictionalized story of Madame Tussaud, or Marie Tussaud. And it starts when she was really little. Her father was a, um, a victim of war. Uh, must have been the French-Prussian War, I think. Uh, before, although no. Well, a war before the French Revolution. <laughs> 20 years before the French Revolution, something like that. And he, he uh, lost his chin. So uh, at that time there were no prosthetics and no plastic surgery and uh, after uh, a grueling time her, her father dies and her mother gets so depressed and she leaves her home with uh, Marie and they go and live with the doctor, Dr. Curtius. And when she enters the home of Dr. Curtius Marie, uh, that is, she all, she sees some really weird stuff, you know, it's a, a tongue, eyeballs, noses, um, uh, lungs, but not real lungs, you know, wax figures, and it sort of uh, starts as a very dis uh, Dixian, Dickensian, Dickensian, sorry, uh, a very Dickensian story and uh, after a week her mother uh, leaves the building in a way. I'm not gonna tell you what happens but something happens and she is left with Dr. Curtius and she asks Dr. Curtius to learn her everything and she learns how to draw, she learns how to make um, uh, wax figures and heads and bodies and and then he meets um, a widow and all, her, her name is only referred to as the widow and it makes her, her life more interest uh, more difficult that's a bit the story and that's the the setting of the story but it's such a beautiful and and fantastic novel it's so um wild in its imagination and it's it's yeah very dickensian it's very dark and gritty and but also very playful and joyful and and uh, 
you really root for Marie and how she becomes famous at the end. And what's also really wonderful is that the, the writer, Edward Carey, is also an illustrator. So he, uh, he leaves all kinds of drawings on the pages and that's so beautiful and it makes you yeah it's it's um is it scary no but it's fascinating it's a fascinating book and oh, i really enjoyed it i felt like a little kid when i read it although it's not for children but it's oh, it's so vividly told it's so visceral it's it's very moving and it's a story about developing, developing talent and especially uh, when nobody believes in you and when you're... Um, oh, it's, it's such an important story because especially if you believe in yourself but nobody else does and finding the strength to still, still continue, that's the main force behind it, this story and it's an absolutely must read uh, you you will be a, a sort of a, um, a witness to the uh, french revolution at the court of louise uh, says she's there when when uh, uh, the king is is um, uh, arrested and beheaded and it's oh, it's amazing. It's an amazing, amazing story. It's moving. It's oh, yeah, powerful. Absolutely, absolutely a must read. And then I read uh, Night Shift by Kiari Lattner, and that's that is about a woman who works at an office. And uh, during her free time in the evening, she writes, I think. It, it has been a, a while since I've read the book. And, uh, and she uh, longs for more quality time for, to, to do her art. And at a certain point, a woman um, comes to work uh, as a sort of interim, comes to work at her office for a week or so. And that woman is from Belgium. She is named uh, Sabine. And... For, to her, it's very a very exotic person. This this uh, novel is it's a new novel, but it's set somewhere in the eighties, I believe. So, and she really is mesmerized by that Sabine, and uh, her f boyfriend already said, "Well, you you talk a lot about that Sabine and uh, a bit too much, and you really feel that uh, she gets absolutely obsessed." Uh, with that woman and she uh, she starts to work as a night uh, during the night shifts and, and at the beginning she doesn't see Sabine very often but she makes sure that she can see her and uh, what Kiari Latner very, does very well is uh, create an atmosphere of uh, toxicity it's dark it's very provocative talk provo uh, thought provocative and the, f uh, the great thing is, at the beginning, you're very focused on the main character, who has no name. But then, um, she, during the, um, the storytelling, she's, she zooms out. And then you see more of how Sabine, and who Sabine really is, and how... Um, yeah, it, it makes you think how uh, people perceive relationships. You can be in a... That's the same with every, every single relationship. When two people are together in a relationship, they never see the relationship the same way. They're not in love the same way. They can be in love and it can be true love, but the love is always different. And... Um, and sometimes we enter in relationships where for you the relationship is a lot more important and a lot more and a lot bigger than it really is for the other person. For the other person it's sometimes just a fling or a friend with benefits. And that is really well handled in this book. It's an absolutely must read. It's a short read. 
and uh, yeah, absolutely great. Then uh, one of the uh, translated novels is has been on uh, BookTube for many, many times already, but I had to read it for uh, my book club in Brussels. And it is Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk. I really enjoyed this novel. So it's about an old uh, school teacher, Janina, who is uh, a, a caretaker uh, of seven uh, summer houses. And she lives somewhere in the woods on her own and she's not taken seriously. She's just an old woman who lives in the woods, yeah. And at a certain point, her two dogs disappear and then her neighbor uh, dies from uh, uh, suffocation and then another neighbor dies and she starts writing letters to the police saying that it's all has that it all has been written in the stars Whew, that was really good <laughs> and then it's really sort of it's a it's a whodunit but it's also sort of a how would I call it, a sort of manifest for nature and uh, taking care of nature and, and, and staying in contact with nature. It, it, it was a really well accomplished book, hence the Nobel Prize. And uh, there's one sentence that I, I underlined and that was, uh, the best conversations are with yourself or at least there's no risk of a misunderstanding. I really like that one. The next one is also uh, translated fiction. It's Earth Eater by uh, Dolores Rice. Race. I had it here, but it's not here. Oh well, doesn't matter. I will put a, a picture up. So this is a very, very dark coming of age story. Uh, it's a tale and it's yeah, it's more of a, a tale than a story and it's also about femicide. So uh, there's a girl who can see what happens to victims if she eats the earth on where that victim has lived. And uh, the first time she does that is when her teacher goes missing and she sees a teacher dead, naked, somewhere in uh, near a, a creek or something and uh, she sees a sign and then she, she already knows that the woman is dead, but sometimes they aren't dead and she says to the police officer, well she's there and they go look for her and indeed she's there and after a while um, people uh, really count on her to find their loved ones. So they, she finds uh, all sorts of bottles of uh, earth in her garden to ask her to, to eat the earth and, and uh, to find their loved ones, which is normal, but yeah, uh, she doesn't want to. She, she does, she's, a, she's a kid who is growing up and she's, she wants to be a normal teenager on the sofa with her PlayStation. That's what she wants and it's her, her right. But um, at a certain point, um, develops um, a relationship with uh, the police officer and then she uh, sees visions of her brother in danger and the whole question is, is, is can she do something about it and uh, will she do something about it and um, so yeah it's it's very much a, a social drama it's uh, it's full of magical realism it's very visceral and it's it's an extremely powerful and complex but very understandable uh, book and it's amazing to me that this book by uh, Dolores Reyes is just a debut. It's, it's the perfect novel, the perfect, everything is, is fits together and there's, there are no flaws in this book. It's so provocative and, and so, yeah. I, it blew me away. If I can ever, write a story like that or come up with a story like that, it that would be in seventh heaven. She's, oh, what a storyteller Dolores Reyes is. 
I don't know if, if she's from Argent Argentina, but it, it, uh, the story is set in the slums of Argentina. So you deal a lot with the poverty and and the gangs and the constant threat of femicide and and yeah, it's uh, mind blowing. Absolutely, I was in. I'm in awe with this author. It's absolutely. This is an author that I will follow for the rest of my life. I hope. Um, I hope she can keep it up. It's it's. And then I read, I felt like reading, um, yeah, sort of a mystery novel as a, a palate cleanser, you know, something light, uh, a no brainer. And then I chose, <laughs> we begin at the end by Chris Whitaker. Boy, <laughs> this is by far the most intelligent, well written uh, crime novel I've ever read, uh, apart from the, 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 Mario Pucci stuff. Uh, no, this is a, a new a way of storytelling to me. But I, I don't, I don't read a lot of crime novels, so I'm not uh, the one to judge. But anyway, I really like this story. So this story is about a 13-year-old old uh, outlaw. Well, that's what she calls herself. Her, she is. Duchess, she's a 13 year old and she is the caretaker of her mom who is an alcoholic and uh, she suffers from depression and, and tries to commit suicide all the time, like we on a weekly basis. And she also takes care of Robin, her little half brother who is like four or five and she loves that little boy to pieces. She does everything for that little guy. And her mother is, is yeah, suicidal, uh, her, her name is Star, and she's suicidal. I think partly because of what happened to her little sister 30 years before. So her little sister was had disappeared and um, they found her after a long search. She was a victim of a car crash. Well, uh, somebody, uh, it was a, she was a victim of a hit and run. That's... And the guy they arrested was a 15 year old uh, boy uh, and he was Vincent King. Yeah, I'm not so very good with names, so I had to write it down. So. Vincent King and he, uh, yeah, he was sent to prison for 13 years. He was uh, convicted as a, an adult and it's like they saw him as a sort of uh, rapist and uh, um, a child abuser, I think, 30 years in prison for a hit and run. He didn't really realize that he killed the girl. So, I mean, that's something that wouldn't happen here. We really uh, count also on the fact that, uh, especially if people show remorse and true remorse, we mostly, um, lighten the sentence so but he stayed 30 years in prison and uh, the way he has done it uh, is very important to the book so i won't tell more about it and then there's also walker he's the um, the sheriff in town but he's a bit of a naive goody body he has an illness uh, but he doesn't want to talk about it. He, he told nobody about it. Only his doctor knows about it. And uh, because he fears that he will lose his job because it's interfering with his work. It's, it really makes his job a whole lot, a lot, a whole lot more difficult. And at a certain point, um, the guy who was in prison for 30 years comes out. He comes back to the village. And then the whole story starts. But what a story. What a story. It's amazing. This is such a well-rounded uh, crime novel. It's so well written with real life um, characters that are with depth and feelings and um, flaws and um, it's it, there's no cliche in this. There's no drunk well, yeah, the mother, but it's it's written on on such a, in such a way, like the way she has to take care of 
her mom, it's heartbreaking. And this, this is also a story about grief and guilt. And it's, it's really a, a story about the motivations of people for doing wrong. And sometimes you do wrong without even realizing it. And it, it's such uh, a great book. At the end, it was a bit rushed. I mean, but for me, it was a five star read. Absolutely. I was, I, f I thought it, I would have read it in, in, in a day or so, in an evening, but I really took my time because it's, it's so well written. So, yeah, we begin at the end by Chris Whitaker. Another five star read, yeah, yeah, I, had a, I was lucky, uh, is uh, The Bell by Iris Murdoch. The book starts with Nora Greenfield and she's on her way to her 13 year old, uh, older, uh, her 13 year old husband, <laughs> no, no, her 13 year old, older, her 13 year old, older, <clears throat> you get what I mean, husband, Paul, who is residing in a sort of spiritual community for a couple of weeks so he can work on the history of that community and the, the convent, the Benedictine convent uh, next to that um, community. On that same train there are uh, two other people who are on their way, and that's Toby and James I believe, they're also on their way to uh, live in that community and the community is run by Michael and Michael is a really interesting character. He's very flawed. So he's the leader, but he doesn't want to be the leader. And he's uh, also has a calling to become a priest, but he's also homosexual and he, uh, he struggles with it. And, and then there's the bell. There's a bell uh, of the convent that has been missing for like two, 300 years. And during that week that uh, they are all there, they're going to replace that bell with a new bell. And that's the setting of the story. Iris Murdoch treats her characters with so much respect and so much love. They're all flawed in their own way, but she doesn't, she has no judgment on them. You know, she doesn't judge them. No matter what, it's um, oh, it's it's also a perfect story. You kind of hate Nora, but you kind of understand her. You understand Paul in a way, but he's also very unlikable. You really understand Michael, but he, you can sense the things they're struggling with. And there's then Toby, who's just a young kid who's just growing up and doing stuff. And then there's James who turned to alcohol and drugs and yeah. But you have to know that this book is written in the 50s. So the way they talk about things is a little bit different, although it's very, very modern and contemporary. So if you would have said it, it it's happening in 2022, you would believe it. It's, it's uh, absolutely great. So uh, this is a marvelous, marvelous story. Uh, the Bell by uh, Iris Murdoch. Really good. Then I read some really bad stuff too, like uh, witches, witch hunting, and women. But I read the translated fix, uh, version by Silvia Frederici. <sighs> no, no. It's about witch hunting and. Um, throughout the ages, but you know, when you start telling a story and you have, you are, you have already made up your mind and when you delve into um, historical facts and you ignore them just because you have already made up your mind, then you have a bad book. So yeah, uh, her claim is that witch hunt was a sort of femicide. 
Yeah, a lot of women got killed, yeah, most of them, but a lot of men got killed too, as witches. And she says so many things that are absolutely wrong and not researched. So when she talks about the Middle Ages, she says that there were common grounds where people could grow their um, weeds and stuff, their food, uh, the poor people could grow their stuff and their food and their uh, vegetables and, and keep some pigs and whatever. That's not true. There weren't, uh, and it wasn't communal, that, that was land from uh, the land owner, the big ones, the, the, the princes and the and the counts and uh, that, that wasn't the counts and, and the, the land owners, they just let them use their land, but after a while they stopped doing that. So it has nothing to do with, uh, she talks about capitalism in the Middle Ages. Interesting. And she says that witch hunt is during the Middle Ages was to suppress the women nothing to do with that it was about greed and envy and hate and mostly greed um i've read so many books about witch hunting they rarely uh, killed the ones that are now perceived as witches like uh the ladies with the herbs and the and the teas and the and the ointments and the uh, they, don't, they didn't kill those because they needed them when they had a toothache and everything. It was mostly people who uh, were elderly or alone and uh, had uh, a nice chunk of land. And the other ones wanted that land. But it's, it's so basic as that. And I know that it's hard to understand. I know. But that's a fact. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, witch hunting just stopped. You know, why? Not because there weren't any witches anymore. No, it was because the neighbors started complaining about that they had to give up their, their wood for, for the winter and uh, the smell and the noises. That's how basic it was all. It was all about greed. It was all about envy. And a lot of witches were claimed witches. You were a witch and the, one, the ones who did that were other women. Sometimes they thought that that woman was sleeping with her husband. It had nothing to do with what you think, Miss. Sylvia Frederici. Sorry, and the the first she starts off with a Scandinavian song, where indeed uh, witches are mentioned, such but also trolls and uh, yeah. But Scandinavian culture isn't Italian or American culture, and trolls and witches were very important. In their culture, it still is. Then I read I Keep the Dead Close, uh, a murder at Harvard and a half century of silence. I forgot the name of the author. I will, uh, you can see it here and I'll put it in, in, this, in the description. I felt like an idiot. I really felt like an idiot. You know, as a writer, you have to realize that even if you do 10 years of research, you know, and after that research, you come to the conclusion that uh, I'm going to tell you the story. So she, there's a, there has been a, there was a murder somewhere in the sixties and uh, uh, in Harvard and people were saying that it was done by a very um, intelligent, a very young professor and, uh, but they kept it quiet and uh, the killer was never found. And uh, yeah, so she starts investigating the murder. And uh, first she blames the 
the professor and then other people from the same university and then and she names them uh, she calls them all by their name and then finally um, after 50 years the case is reopened it turns out that it was just a random killing by a, a serial killer so the teacher has uh, the professor had got nothing to do with that uh, murder seriously seriously if after 10 years of investigation and you come to the conclusion that after a dna test it was some random dude stop writing and don't publish the book i'm sorry because people don't always read the entire book and to call everybody by name and showing their pictures and as a person of interest or as the possible killer that's so damaging uh, no 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 so yeah we keep the dead close at a murder at harvard and half a century of silence then another really bad book of poetry pillow thoughts by uh courtney pepper now maybe you're running scared because running is better than letting someone else in but the truth is, you can't spend your whole life running. It's exhausting living in fear. Slow down. Chances and risks keep life interesting. Of all the maps in the world, the only one I will follow is the map to your heart. Makes me think about a, 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 a poem that we used to write when we were like uh, 12, 13, like a ring is round and has no end. So is my love for you, my friend. But the world is exhausted and the only wealth we have left is love. I want to mention this one because it was really interesting. It's called uh, Sex for Money, a uh, history of prostitution in Belgium. You know, you have to know Belgium is only uh, blah, 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 170 years old, so uh, near 190 years old, sorry. It starts at the Middle Ages or even before that and uh, up to now and it's really about the evolution of prostitution or sex work as they call it because they don't um, they use the term sex work because um, it's it's more uh, a bigger word than just a prostitute it's also uh, courtesans and uh, kept women and yeah it was really really interesting and it was also um, how uh, government deals with it and um, how uh, villages de dealt with it so it's really um uh, they always say that uh, prostitution is uh, the oldest um uh, profession in the world that's not entirely true um in the sense that uh it only became a profession since there are villages or uh, a lot of people living together and when there's uh, poverty and uh, yeah the, the when there are people that are having difficulty to survive and uh, or uh, when people want to make easy money or at least they think at the beginning so yeah that's uh, it was really interesting it was a really good read so uh, if, if somebody can read Dutch uh, sex for uh, Sex for Geld and Geschiedenis van Prostitutie in Belgium. Sex for Money. A History of Prostitution in Belgium. Really interesting. And also how the Catholic Church and everything deals with it. It's really interesting. It's written by Elvin Hoffman, Magali Rodriguez Garcia, and Peter van Hee. So, yeah, that's it. No. I would say uh, happy reading. Good reading. Have a nice day. And uh, yeah, talk to you later. Bye-bye.